it. Last week we added Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5 5 says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God, the God kind of love, it's not something that you're born with. It's not something that you come equipped with. You receive the God kind of love in your heart when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is part of how the Holy Spirit, who comes to live inside of us, who will never leave us, is part of how he expresses himself. We, we receive a God kind of love. It's a different word in the Greek. It's a whole different word. We, we say love, 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 and it means a whole bunch of different things. It doesn't in, in the Greek. It's agape. Agape means the God kind of love. It is not a human love. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God, the agape, has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So last week, we talked about the, the God kind of love, and we talked about the ministry of reconciliation very important that Christians know what the ministry of reconciliation is. But I am not going to go over that today. If you missed it last week, please go back and listen to it. Very important. If we continued on here in Romans, he would talk about it in verses 6 through 11. We also looked at it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. So love is of the heart. Remember, we've learned that the Spirit leads us, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God, and it's through our spirits that we get that leading, that we get that direction. Where do we hear the voice of God for our life? In our spirit, as opposed to our head, as opposed to our feelings, as opposed to the circumstances around us. Lots of times we just let circumstances just push us every which way. You are not being led by the Holy Spirit when circumstances are just tossing you here and there. Love is of the heart. So the one thing that we, we're going to review and then we're going to go forward this morning, we're going to look at a whole other side. So that's why it's really important that you understand what we did last week because this week is... Uh, some, some things where we miss it in love. This month, we're going to be talking about love. Um, Pastor Brad and I both, we're, the main thing <laughs> with love is relationships. You know, walking in love would be super easy if you didn't have to deal with other people. Amen. Walking in love would be super easy. And then as soon as somebody walks in the room... Now you've got a challenge, okay? So we're going to be talking about relationships. Um, Brad and I have worked in youth ministry for a lot of years, and that is very close to our heart. We're going to be talking to our young people who um, are not married yet. We're going to be talking to our married people. We have, for all of you guys, we've got, we've got some advice and some tips and, and some things looking at what the Word of God has to say, so you don't want to miss that. You know, we have other relationships. People, we talk a lot, I think, here about how we have to deal with people in the world, right? The people we work with in the workplace. Um, but, you know, probably the most challenging thing is the people we live with um, in our extended family. You know, those are the people that we care the most about. So, uh, you know, some, you meet somebody that you don't like that rubs you the wrong way and you, you don't have to see them again. It's not really a big deal, right? So we're going to be talking about that. So you don't want to miss out because we're going to be we're going to be getting real with it. But um, this morning, if you'll just if you'll just uh, dig in for a minute here, we're going to get into the word. So we'll have a foundation to build off of. Okay. All right. So in Galatians five twenty two, it's talking about the fruit of the spirit. Okay, so the Spirit's been poured out in our hearts. The Spirit expresses His presence with the love of God. Okay, 
Galatians 5.22 says, and I'm going to give you some definitions of some of these words as we go, okay? So, so hang with me. But the fruit of the Spirit, we said the Holy Spirit is the seed, and fruit, the fruit is love. It's growing in us. It's developing in us. We saw in 1 John, be perfected in this love. Be matured in this love. We read in 1 Corinthians 13. We said that's a great thing, uh, uh, 4 through 8, to put that on a card and put it by your bedside, especially if you're having trouble in your marriage or in any particular relationship. If you'll put that on there and you'll read it over yourself, uh, the definition of love, and you'll put your name instead of love and read it over and over and over. It will change you, and it will change your relationships, and it will single-handedly affect your marriage, even if you're the only one that does it. All right, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and this is a divine love. It is strong, ardent, tender, compassionate, and it is devoted to the well-being of others. All of these fruit, when a tree bears fruit, it's not for the tree. It's for other people to partake of, right? That's what these, these fruit are here in our lives for. So I want you to think about as we look at the definition of love, I want you to think about how this is, this is not for me. This is for the people my life touches. So it's a devotion to someone else's well-being, the God kind of love. Joy, it is delight over blessings received or expected for self and for others. Peace, a state of quietness, rest, repose, harmony, order. God means for our families to be homes of peace and harmony and order. Patience. Patient endurance. It means we're putting up with somebody's something. Patient endurance to bear long with frailties, offenses, injuries, and provocations of others without murmuring, it just got harder, right? Without murmuring, kindness, soft-spoken, even-tempered, goodness, kind, virtuous, generous, God-like in conduct. Goodness, God-like in conduct. And I love faith. The King James says faith. The New American Standard says faithfulness. It is the inward, wholehearted confidence, assurance, trust, and reliance in God and all that he says. Being very sure of God and all that he says. Gentleness means kind, indulgent, you know, we tend to be indulgent of ourselves. We're going to see that word come up again in a negative way. But I thought it was interesting. It made the list for good. We're talking about being indulgent of other people. Uh, even balanced. Suffering injuries without feeling a spirit of revenge. Self-control. A moderation in the indulgence of appetites and passions. Against such, against these things, there is no law. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit as well. So just um, living by the Spirit is not the end. If we live by the Spirit, well, let's follow the Spirit as well. That means we could not do that. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Last week, we said that every step out of love is sin. Every step taken out of love is a step in the wrong direction. Failure to walk in love, to say it another way, will hinder you from following God's plan for your life. And we don't ever want to permit ill will or animosity in our lives. So we're going to stay a lot today in the book of Galatians. It has so much to help us in this. 
Uh, so we're going to look at Galatians 5. We're going to go up above that to verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. You were called to freedom. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, or worldliness, or selfishness, but serve one another through love. The Amplified says, but through love, serve and seek the best for one another. So the more that you study love, it is directly associated, the expression of love is serving one another. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. He also said, the greatest among you is the servant of all. So we're going to see this correlation with serving one another and walking in love. Uh, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in, in, in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that also means you shall love yourself as you love your neighbor. It goes both ways. It's equal. When something's equal, it means it has to be balanced on both sides. We, if we flip it and it doesn't work, then it wasn't equal, okay? As um, or like means equal. I can help you with your math. <laughs> All right, so uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love yourself as you love your neighbor. I think sometimes people get into some difficulties and problems in life because they think love is something that it's not. And we're going we're gonna to see some things that love is not. Keep going. Chapter 5, verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So we've got these two things that are competing within us. Our flesh has a set of wants, and the spirit has a set of wants, and they don't match. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. We just read that the uh, love satisfies the law. Verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality. And I just want to say that's talking about a relationship outside of what God said. God said that belongs in marriage. Anytime we try to... Uh, get outside of the bounds of the word of God, you're sowing curses into your life. For marriage, in marriage, in any, any kind of way. Doesn't matter what the world says is okay. Keep going. In, impurity. My point is, love has boundaries. Love has limits. Love is not everything goes. I was reading after um, a woman that was writing at the very beginning of um, the 1900s, and she said, I think the reason that we tolerate so much is because we don't believe anything. And I was like, man, you could have wrote that today. All right, keep going. Uh, impurity. Indecent behavior. Idolatry, witchcraft, these are the acts of the flesh that are contrary to the spirit, that are contrary to the love of God. There's a difference. Hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. 
Yep, that's what that says up there. So that means dividing up, you know, dividing in to, up to groups and us against them. Um, uh, the Amplified says a party spirit there. I mean, and you're, you're, it doesn't mean like party, like woohoo, let's party. It means, um, you know, dividing up into parties. You know, like which party are you on? Um, dividing into groups with peculiar opinions. 21, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the love of God. Now, I want you to keep this in context of what we learned last week, how deep and high and wide is the love of God. When God gives us directions, it's because he loves us. And we are, as his children, we love his correction because it means he loves me and has better things for me and I'm making decisions that are holding me back. Okay, let's look at Matthew 27. I mean, I'm sorry, 22, 37. Matthew 22, 37. And Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is equally true. You shall love yourself as you love your neighbor. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. If you've ever read the law in the Old Testament, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And man, it gets particular. They count out stuff and sort stuff and do this, don't do that. If your ox falls in a hole and the man knew he dug the hole. I mean, it's just like wild. But Jesus said it's really not that hard. It comes down to these two commandments, right? Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice in, in this right here, looking at verse 37, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. So one thing I want you to realize, our love should be ordered. We're called to an ordered Love. Who comes first? Yes. And sometimes people get in trouble with the idea of love because they don't have ordered love. He said, this is first, foremost, the great commandment. So the second one comes after the first. Okay? All right, and we love other people with the same love that we love ourselves, and when we do that, we see that we're all in the same boat. I want your well-being, and I want my well-being, okay? It's the same kind of love. We're in the same boat together. I'm not out to promote myself. I'm not out to uh, be ambitious. Uh, for me, I love you. I want God to promote you. I want the word of God to work in your life. I want you to experience him the same way I want the word of God to work in my life and experience him. As we talk about an ordered love, I want you to think about the tithe. Tithe means the first tenth. It's the first tenth. I'm just telling you what the word <laughs> says. It's not the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth tenth. It's the first tenth. This is part of an example of an ordered love. Jesus said, how can you serve two masters? All right, so we said that love and service, we're going to keep seeing this come up. Love and service. Jesus said, how can you serve two masters? You can't serve God and money. You're either going to love one and hate the other, 
or you're going to hate the one and love the other. You know what I mean? You can't serve. So he switched from love to serve and from serve to love. So that gives you something to think about. Let's look at that verse. That is Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot say, you cannot serve God and wealth. We're talking about an ordered love, all right? Listen, God wants to do some things in our lives. He wants to break through. He wants to do some things in our church, and he's wanting to help us. Okay, so now let's look, go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. I mean, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, so we're talking to Christians, okay? Even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, we're talking about love. And we've learned all these things about what love is. And we've learned that it's hard, right? Love's hard. It's hard to put your flesh under and to be patient and kind and gentle and all of these things. But the devil will use your desire to walk in love against you. All right. So, and this is in Galatians 6. This is, a, this is what he was talking about. We're still in that same idea of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the, the fruit of the flesh is contrary to the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, this is what should happen. You who are spiritual are to restore, bring them back to the place of Christ and in grace. And such, such a person, restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you're not tempted as well. Okay? So restoring people, getting them out of sin, you have to be careful because it can be a slippery slope. Verse 2, bear, that word bear means sympathize. It means feel with them, feel along with them, show mercy, love them, bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? He just told us the law of love. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, deceives himself. Okay? So that means don't think that you're too good to go help somebody else and bear their burdens. Okay? All right. Verse 4. And, but each one of you must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting. So we're not supposed to be comparing ourselves to each other. Okay? If you are comparing yourself uh, to somebody that's not doing a great job and it makes you think you're great, that's, that's not a very good comparison. So, but each one must examine his own work and then he'll have reason for boasting, but to himself alone and not to another. So test your work, test yourself with the law of love. Okay? And you just say, yeah, am I passing the law of love or am I not? That's how you test yourself. And then verse 5, he says, for each one will bear his own load. Verse 2 said, bear one another's burdens. And verse 5 said, for each one will bear his own load. This seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? All right, so if we look in verse 2, the Greek word there is for load. Some of them say burdens and some of them say load. Mine says burdens. That word is baros, and it means burden, grief, misery, pressure of another, ex excess burdens. We're talking about times of tragedy and crisis. And you know, I have spent my whole adult life in ministry or even before that, living with my parents and, 
being there, you know, when things happen. Um, and I would say when people go through crisis and tragedy, it is the easiest thing in the world to be there for them. It's like, you know, it's a phone call and everything's changed. And some, the love of God rises up in you. And it's so easy. Stay up all night. Whatever it takes. It's so easy. The love of God is so present to empower you to carry someone else's burdens. We're talking about excess burdens, right? But verse 5, the Greek word is P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. It's like portion, but a P-H instead. Portion. It means load or responsibility. Talking about a, day, a daily load. Each one is to bear their own load. The one, let's keep going. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches them. For do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. So I want you to see that there is two kind of things happening here. And God is, is instructing us to deal with them differently. When um, some people think that their excess burdens, their baros in the Greek, they think that that is their daily load. And they think they're supposed to carry that themselves. And it's too much. And they need to, that's part of being part of a church family, is people come along and surround you and help you carry that load. And some people don't let people in and help them to do that. But... Other people think that their daily load is an excess burden and that somebody should help them carry their load. Do you know, I mean, have you ever known? Have you ever known anybody like that? It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Why? Not our load. Jesus said, come and learn from me. I am humble of heart my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. All right. So that's one of the things that as Christians walking in love, we have to be able to judge. Is this an excess burden that it is my job to come along and swoop them up and help carry them? Or is this their load that they need to carry? They need to stir the gift of God up. They need, I know, you know, in my life I've had people call me, they're down, discouraged, and you know, like you just minister to them, you give them the word, you encourage them, and they're so built up by the time you get off the phone. And the next week they call, and they are back where they were at the beginning last time. And you do it again, and the next week, and you're like, I feel like you're a bucket with a hole in it. All right, so for each one, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. Okay, this is a law that we need to understand. Whatever a person sows, that will he reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh... When we read up there in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, he said these are the deeds of the flesh. That's an example of, of sowing to the flesh. Listen, if someone is sowing to the flesh, it doesn't matter if you're their mama or you're their grandma, if you're their dad, it de they're going to reap what they sowed. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people, 
especially those who are of the household of faith. Okay, so Galatians 6, 7 says, a man reaps what he sows. This is a very important principle to teach our children. It's a very important principle to be aware of. For example, if you exercise, you'll have better health. The Bible says, do you want friends? Be friendly. Go to work. You get a paycheck. Act lovingly. You have better relationships. There's also other kinds of consequences. If you're going to act like that, you're not going to do it with me. Your choice. We can't, we shouldn't try to control other people's choices. We shouldn't. But it's okay to say, if that's your choice, it won't be with me. You choose to live like that. Idleness, responsibility, out of control behavior is so into poverty and failure. Uh, I'll tell on Pastor Brad a little bit because he would never tell this. Um, you know, he works a full-time job as well as we call this our passion project. And we don't go six months that somebody doesn't call and offer him a job and try to get him to come work for them because he's a very good employee. And what he does, uh, he started at minimum wage. This wasn't, he has a college degree, but um, his college degree was in chemistry, and he's kind of like wiped all that chemical stuff out of his brain, and um, he works in computers now. But his start in computers were, was when we were in Bible school, and it was a minimum wage job, seven fifty an hour. And, you know, it just, it doubled. And he just was faithful. But I want to tell you um, what, one of the things that he's, he's sown in his work is uh, if you want to sow to reap on the job, show up, show up on time, show up prepared, show up to do your best, and show up and do it for Jesus. And I've watched him, and I've got the blessing since he works from home, and we're in the next room, and we can hear him. Um, one of the jobs he had, the man uh, didn't know very much about him, but just, I don't know, he was like, I want you to be in charge. I want to do something new here. I want to have company prayer, and I want you to lead it every Wednesday morning. And I got to listen to him lead company prayer with all kinds of people, lots of them not Christians, all over the world. Yeah, there was people from Turkey. Um, and I got to, to hear him do that for Jesus. And, you know, so you want to sow, uh, you want to sow on your job. If you'll do that, you'll be blessed and you'll increase. But then I also want to say is that, remember, our love is supposed to be ordered. You know, where does God fit into that? Would you go to work if it was raining? Would you go to church if it was raining? I mean, you know, like we pretty much know when it's raining that the numbers are going to be down. You know? So, I mean, we got to order our love. We've got to make sure that we're aware of what message we're sending to God, to our children. You know, yeah, it's raining, but I think, I think I'll be okay, right? And you guys, you guys know you're doing it. All right, so we want to think about this ordered love. Uh, love does not interfere with natural consequences. Love does not interfere with sowing and reaping. And sometimes this is hard for parents, right? 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, if anyone will not work, you know what it says? He or she shouldn't eat. If you got somebody that doesn't want to work, he shouldn't eat. So, you know, for, for grown children, you teach them you don't quit a job unless you have a better job lined up. 
and you don't interfere with the natural consequence to not working. Hunger. Problems come when someone interrupts the law of sowing and reaping in someone else's life. And they may never feel the need to change. Okay. So it's a different side of love, isn't it? Natural consequences. Not yelling. Not nagging. Nagging has this magical ability to make somebody come deaf to you. So nagging doesn't work. Yelling doesn't work. Natural consequences work. All right. All right, so let's just talk about, I want to see where I want to go in the time we have. We had lots of fun things today. Um, one thing I want to mention is that children, one time I had a, a mom ask me, she was like, I got called in to my kid's school this week and had a conference with the teacher and the teacher was so upset and, and thinks there's something develop, developmentally wrong with my son. And I was like, well, you know, what was she complaining about? What was he doing? She was like, well... At the end of lunch, he opens up his milk carton and he stuffs all the food he hadn't eaten down into his milk carton. I said, well, that sounds pretty childish, but considering he's an eight-year-old boy, I think he's right on, <laughs> you know? So sometimes as parents, we're trying to force our children uh, to not act like children. So, so it's okay for children to be childish, Sometimes we want them to act like adults, and they're not adults. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Don't hinder them. Don't offend them. Uh, don't get in their way. So, uh, but we can early on teach our children about consequences. We don't want to interfere with their natural consequences. Children are so beautiful. They're so precious. They're so quick. I remember my babies would crawl across the floor, you know, and go to stick something into the, to the socket, you know, and you would say, um, no. And if they wouldn't do it, then, you know, you'd smack their hand so they would know that would smart and they would associate. I can't do that. That hurts. And then they go and they do it again and you do it again, right? And then about the third time, it's not many times, they go over to the socket and they put their hand up, but before they do it, they look at you. They know, right? They're looking to see, are we for real about this? And so that's a very important thing for parents is just to be consistent. Miss Allie has grandbabies. Some, I don't know, one is not even a year old yet that does sign language can communicate with mama, I want milk, with sign language. Babies are amazing. There's so much they can learn, and sometimes we underestimate what they can do and what responsibilities they can have. Uh, Jonah, when he was uh, at the dentist, and the, dentist, they, the hygienist found out that he was going to live at home for college, she was like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. She said, when are you going to learn to do your laundry? And he said, learn to do my laundry? He said, I've been doing my laundry since I had to pull a stool up to reach the stuff in the bottom of the washing machine. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's not going to be a problem. That's one of the great things about having lots of kids is you just can't do it all. And so they have to learn to do stuff. All my kids know how to cook. All my kids know how to clean because we got to get it done, you know. Uh, I can't do, I'm not here just to do everything for everybody. Uh. <laughs> All right, but kids love responsibility. You tell them that washing machine is a big old machine, and you're going to learn to use it today. And you do it young enough, and they'll think it's awesome. And you don't ever have to tell them different. All right, so, but adult children being childish is not okay, right? Um, adult responsibilities means that you live within your means and pay for your failures, some parents have lots of money and want their kids to have a lifestyle they can't afford. And they pay for vacations and uh, hobbies and clothes that really aren't in their means, aren't really in their lifestyle. 
and other parents constantly bail out kids that get into trouble. But both scenarios prevent their children from achieving independence. When you rescue somebody from natural consequences, you're rendering them powerless. They need to learn the fruit of self-control. They need to learn that my choices have consequences and I'm responsible for my choices. And children can start learning that at a very young age. Uh, another pitfall is when we disown our choices and try to lay the responsibility on someone else, like he made me do it, she made me do it, I had to. God says he'll always show you a way out. He'll always give you a way out. You don't ever, you're never, with God, you're never in a corner. If you feel like you're pushed in a corner, then that means that the devil's showing you a scenario that's not true and you've got to look. I know there's times, you know, that I feel, I feel that way, you know, and then I just start praying, Lord, I thank you. It is not the way it looks. So show me the way. Show me the way. All right. You know, God's family has strong values and standards, and, and so should our family. So should our families. I just want us to make sure we're aware of sometimes that we think love means that we just put up with everything. We're just a doormat. We take it all. That whatever somebody gives us, we take it. God has never called us to abuse. He's never called us to be in a situation. God wants you married. He wants to bless your marriage, and he wants you to stay married. But if you're in an abusive situation, he wants you to get out. Um, and I just want to give you one more um, example. The Bible instructs that natural consequences of sin in the church. Did you know that the Bible addresses that? Um, 1 Corinthians 5, let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Uh, it, it, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world or with the greedy, the swindlers, with the idolaters. I didn't mean the ones in this world, he says, or you'd have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or a greedy person or an idolater or is verbally abusive or habitually drunk or a swindler. Don't even eat with such a person. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? Do you not know that those who are with, do not judge, do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside, God judges. Remove the evil person from among you. Let's close with a look at an example from scripture, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. So it's amazing how the Bible just covers all sorts of things. And you know, and then we have that sort of in-between stage of our life when we are becoming an adult, right? But we still live with our parents. And, 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 and I realize that not everyone has the choice. Not everyone lives in a Christian home. And so there's certain things that we, we have to respect and live with. God gives us the grace and shows us how to deal with whatever situation we're in. God loves you and cares about you. And I, you're not on the outside no matter what your situation is. Now, last week, we talked about the ministry of reconciliation. And there's an example of that in chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, let's start at verse 3. Now, Jesus told him this ter parable saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and goes after the one who was lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, 
Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is an example of the ministry of reconciliation. Notice that the man goes out and hunts and looks for the lost one and doesn't come back till he's found him. And when he finds him, he carries him home on his shoulders. And then he tells everybody, let's celebrate, let's rejoice. But when we look over in verse 11, we have the story of the prodigal son. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, and this, this is a parable. It has so many levels of meaning. Uh, but I want us to look at it as a family, but also as God the father. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So first of all, I want you to notice that this son said, I want to leave. And he was free to go. He was free to go. Did the dad go hunting after him? Did he go chasing him down? Son, you're free to go. So he went, verse 15, and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his, he, into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of that swine, that, that, of what the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, what made him come to his senses? He... he he was reaping what he said. He was hungry. He was hungry. Mama wasn't sending care packages, right? Wasn't sending gift cards to restaurants. He was hungry. He's like, this life stinks. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. This was a very humble return. He didn't say, restore me back, dad. I'm back. He said, listen, I don't deserve to be called your son. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, quickly, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his, on his hand and sandals on his feet. Dress him. Restore him. Let's move fast and bring the fattened calf. Kill it and help us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he has been found. Now let us, and they began to celebrate. This is the father's love. But I just want you to understand the balance of love. People who don't repent, we put limits on. People who are not repentant. Jesus said, go and do acts according to repentance. People who haven't repented, we should forgive. When we don't forgive, we're still wanting something from them. And we're holding ourselves to them. So it's very important that we forgive and release. But it doesn't mean we let them have a place in our life to continue 
to live ungodly. We separate. Sometimes it's emotional separation. Sometimes it's geographical separation. It's whatever it needs to be. But we don't want to enable somebody to continue to live ungodly. We don't want not towards us, not because of us. So we must forgive. That's not optional. Love forgives. Okay? And so this is something, and this is something we can, we can get victory in. Some of these things hold us back, and they try to come back. And sometimes we think we've dealt with something, and here it comes again. Right? And what we have to say, the word says, submit to God. Submit under the mighty hand of God. I always say, Lord, I always picture that when I'm having to go through this. Your mighty hand, I'm getting up under it. I'm going to get up under your mighty hand. I'm going to submit to what your word says. Forgive me for letting this hold me back. Forgive me for holding on to this. I'm going to release this and let it go. So we have the first thing you have to do is get up under his mighty hand. Submit to God. And then you confess your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Lots of times we need to confess and ask for forgiveness when we've held on to something. When we've held on to bitterness or resentment, um, sometimes, I mean, that is just really a sign that we don't have the proper boundaries in our life. It means our love is not ordered. It means God doesn't have first place. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure I've expressed this as well as I want to express it this morning, but our love should be ordered. When we give God first place, he can work. He can set you free. It feels like freedom. It feels like freedom. That's what it feels like when you give God first place. It means I don't put the love of anybody else above my love of God. I don't put my career the pursuit of money or success. I don't put the love of my parents or the love of my, my spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or the idea of that. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And when we get him in first place, it means we don't get to do whatever we want, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth places. How we deal with other people, we have to go to him. And I feel like marriage can be a hard place to do that because of fear, right? Fear is usually one, the main thing of anything if we're not walking by faith. Fear, fear of not being loved, fear of what will I do, fear of I don't see a way out for me. When you're feeling like, I don't see a way out for me, that's not God's plan for your life. He, he's got a way out for you. Lord, I'm getting under your mighty hand, and you're going to show me the way out. And he will every time. I think with parents, it's hard. It is, isn't it? Hard to let go and let our adult children. It's hard to say, you know what? This isn't okay. I'm not going to support this. It's hard, isn't it? We can be afraid of losing them, afraid of losing fellowship with them. But we have to think about, you know, the story of the prodigal son. He was free to go. And people have to be free. They have to be free to make their own decisions. They have to be free to choose God for themselves, or they haven't really chosen him at all. And that's something we have to be careful of as parents is if we're heavy-handed, then we make our children obey while we're watching. But you don't know what they're doing when you're not watching. You want to raise up your children, choose. You, you want to make the right choice here. There's consequences, and you want the good ones. It's your choice. Let's stand to our feet.
But there's areas that God can set us free in. There's areas that he can set us free. We want our love to be ordered. When God has first place, man, that's the best kind of marriage. The best kind of marriage is when a husband and a wife give God first place. And it affects who you, who you can date. It affects how you can live. It affects what you accept in your children, in your house. Yeah. Let's go to the Father. Lord, I just thank you. Thank you that your word is so good and so complete. Father, we want to give you first place. Lord, we want our love to be ordered. We don't love money. We love you. We don't love our family more than you. We don't put them in a place that belongs to you. I thank you for showing us a way out. Lord, I hear people saying, yeah, but how do I do that? I don't see that. I don't see how I can get there. Thank you, Father God. Lord, we just commit and submit ourselves to your word. And we, we commit and, and submit, Father God, to have the kind of marriages that you've called us to have. To be the kind of parents of young children and, and, and big kids and then grown kids. We're not, we're not done impacting our world. And Father God, we thank you that as we order, as we order our love, Father God, we're opening up for you to work powerfully, for you to fill all in all, as we read last week, that you fill all in all to know this love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, to know the depth with the same love that you so loved the world with the same love that you said we're to go out and seek out the lost we're to look high and low we're to look in the bushes and behind the trees and down by the river and look for the lost and carry them in on our shoulders it's the same love that we're to order our families it's the same love that we're to order our marriages. And Father God, I thank you that we're opening the door for you to move powerfully. Father, to, to do what we, we couldn't even imagine. To restore, to bring all things unto you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this great love. What manner of love, what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just want to give you the opportunity if there is anyone here that hasn't made Jesus your Lord and Savior. It was for you that he died it was for you that he came. We want to give you that opportunity. We want to give you that opportunity. So simple. It's just recognizing, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want this love shed abroad in my heart. I want to grow in knowledge of you. Is there anybody with every head bowed and eye closed? Is there anybody in here this morning that says, I want to do that today. I don't want to go another day without accepting Jesus as my Lord. I don't want to let another day pass. Hallelujah. Greatest decision you'll ever make. Greatest decision you'll ever make is to run into the arms of the Father. Hallelujah. If you're here and you want to do that, just raise your hand. Hallelujah. And let's pray with those online. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's a good day. 
going to let Pastor Matt pray. Glory to your name. Just, just reach out your hand and say, Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you sent Jesus because you love me. Today, I make a declaration that Jesus is my Lord. I follow you. I put you first in my life because you love me. I thank you for this new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. We want to celebrate. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. If, you, if there's anybody here that needs prayer, that would like prayer this morning for anything, for anything that's healing, you want us to join together with you in faith, uh, just lift, lift your hands and we'll be glad to pray with you. God is so good. He brings us together so that we can not just have fun together, but we can get in there for each other, as Miss Jennifer told us this morning. We're carrying each other through tough times, through hard times. And that's when we join our faith together so we can get through. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for health, for healing, protection, for safety in True North Church. I thank you, Father God, that each family that's represented here today, that, Father God, that you continue to bless us, that you continue to keep your hand on us, that you continue to lead us. You lead us. You lead us every step of the way. And, Father God, you are easy to follow. Oh, you make it so clear and so plain for us to follow that we can't miss it. And then, Father God, that you're helping us each and every step of the way to be close to you, to be following you, and to be where you want us to be in your perfect will. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. Thank you, Father God, that we're a light. And then, Father God, that your love is powering that light on the inside of us and that people are drawn to you as we love you in Jesus' name. And if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you need to tell somebody. Yes. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Happy Valentine's.